All right, I think we're we got it to work. It's green. Perfect. Are we talking? Is that Seth? That's Seth. How you doing, man? Uh, I, there's so many buttons here. I don't even know what to push. <laughs> Good grief. No worry. It, 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 it happens with age. It comes with the territory, Seth. Hey, did you stay up late last night for any reason? I, I did a little. I did stayed up. Uh, no, I, I, went to sleep, uh, I went to sleep early, but I woke up at 3 a.m. Boston time to go, uh, to go buy this stuff. I, I, went, I went to bed at 12. I, I stayed up until 12.01. You know, but I don't know. Did you did you did you happen to purchase what you needed to purchase? I believe I did because they, I actually pre went on there and then got everything set up and like I was good to go. So the iPhone fairy came by last night. Yeah, are you? Can, is your mic close to you? Yeah, my my mic's over here. Hey, Miguel, how's it going? It's Javier. Uh, hello, Javier. How's it going? Good. So, which which size did you did you get the did you go with the five twelve or did you <laughs> keep it reasonable? Five twelve, no five twelve XS black and Apple Watch four LTE uh, cheap uh, in closing. Nice. Yeah, I looked at my because I have the I have the ten and I not even using half of the the memory that I have and I'm just like you know what I don't need the big one so I got the iPhone XS Max something like I don't did one of our marketing guys yeah. go over to Apple and start naming things over there yeah I agree I agree that did happen no I did I did the same thing that you did I looked at my storage and the problem is that I have 256 right but I only have 20 gigs left free space so oh to me was, yeah, I reached my limit I've reached my limit Fa fantastic all right so I want to get into what you're talking about today because I saw this project. I don't know. You told me. I don't remember when I saw you, but you were like, in my copious amounts of free time, I decided. Oh, sorry. I'm too loud. Someone's like their ears. I know. I know. I'm so loud. I'm sorry. How do we turn me down? Mic number two. I'll, I'll move away. I'll move away. Thank you. Okay. So you said in your copious amounts of time that. Uh, am I too loud? Oh, they, they say I'm way too loud. Gosh, you guys know me, right? Yeah. You said in your copious amounts of time, you spent some time building something, and that's what you're talking about today. Yeah. Is that right? It's one of the things. I'm gonna. I'm going to talk about five things, and that's going to be one of them. So can we turn his audio up to and turn my audio down? I'm to okay, he's figuring it out. Okay, okay. Stop yelling. Yeah, I'm not yelling. Oh, this oh, is oh, my oh, normal yeah. voice. He's yelling. Like, you, have you never seen me on the television like before? I was on cops once, Javier, but my face was blurred out, and I was in the back of the car. I was yelling at that time. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll I'll uh, I'll go a little bit less loud, but uh, we're going to turn the time over to Miguel to talk a little bit about Retro.net. You're up, buddy. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Miguel de Casa, and. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about Retro.net, which is a collection of. Uh, of tools that uh, help you build great uh, mobile applications. So some of you might not know this. Uh, are, we, are we live? Yeah, we're, we're still going, buddy. We can oh, still see you. No, we are. We are. You can see us. Oh, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right. But, but this is being broadcast. That's a question. Yes, you are still being broadcast. Everyone's loving what you're doing. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, anyways, I want to talk to you about Retro.net. And, uh, you know, as uh, I've spent a lot of my life uh, working on, on Unix. And uh, uh, and uh, even even uh, despite the fact that I worked on the Linux desktop and I work on mobile applications, the, the console is still the place where I do most of my work. And, uh, and over the years, I had to write a lot of little apps uh, on the console, and I, you know, and I keep working on the console. This is my file manager. What you see on the screen, uh, this is still the way that I that I work every day. Um, so uh, let me tell you. Let me show you. Uh, let, let me tell you what I wanted. So um, uh, today I want to cover a couple of libraries uh, that I've built, uh, or that my team has built that uh, help you build good uh, developer experiences. And I also want to tell you 
how you can turn these applications into uh, in, uh, to something that you can use as a tool in your system. So let me start there. So first off, uh, I want to talk about three three components. Uh, I'm going to say there's three pillars. The first one is writing tools that that integrate with your environment, whether it be Windows or Unix, and and that starts parsing command line arguments. Right, so that's the first piece. Um, the second piece is going to be once you have one of the tools, sometimes you have an interactive tool, uh, not a full desktop, not, not a full physical application, but something that needs to be like a shell. So we'll talk about that. And thirdly, we're going to talk about uh, building GUI applications or terminal user interfaces on the console. So let's get started with command line parsing. So uh, this is my go-to uh, library that I use for uh, uh, building uh, command line applications. And the idea is that when you write a uh, Line tool. You want to. You want one of the most common tasks is parsing the arguments, uh, the arguments that are passed as the string array are to your main. Um, and uh, you want to integrate properly with the environment, and that means uh, you know these days the convention uh, on Unix is dash uh, and a letter short option and space and, a and an optional parameter or dash dash uh, for a long option. Name equals and the value and uh, any other arbitrary thing. So instead of having everybody implement this over and over, we this little library called mono.options. Uh, it is not linked to mono. You can use it on, on .NET Framework, .NET Core, uh, mono, and uh, and it's available as a NuGet. But also <laughs> something that is very interesting. This is a library that is implemented in a single file. So you don't need to use a NuGet if you don't want to. You can just also use your file like known. Thank you for a couple of things that this ever does. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, I extracted this out of a little tool that I wrote recently, which is a implementation of NetCat. It's just a little program that takes its standard input and sends it over the net, or can ex uh, get data out of the network and send it to standard out. And uh, and in this particular case, um, this is how you define the option. So let's walk through a couple of examples. Uh, the first line says that. Uh, uh, Finds option four. That means that you can pass the option dash four to your application, and uh, and you can invoke this little method in particular in this lambda here. And all this does at this point uh, is set the variable this boolean value IPv4 to true, right? So these are the way that you define what happens when this option was passed. So you can do any arbitrary thing there. Uh, let's go to the fourth line. On the fourth line, you see that there's a there's a little L and then the pipe operator and then listener. What this does is it defines two possible ways of invoking this option, either with a shortcut, right, with a single parameter, dash L, or passing dash dash listener, right? So in this case, it would accept those two options. Uh, you can also notice here that all of these options are helpful. Uh, this is a string that will be used uh, when you need to get help, right? So when you vote it and then you request some help, we automatically generate that list of options. Now, the next line that is also interesting, I want you to look at this. It has this syntax, P and, and then the Piper Bray of port equals. And what this means is that it's telling mono options, this parameter, this, this option takes a parameter, right? The way that I described it before. So, um, and, and the rest are just other things that are just, right? Uh, but these are effectively the ways they define the option. Now, there's a lot more power, but we're Started there, and uh, this is an actual invocation of the application, and you can see how this is used uh, in this particular case, right? You see the dash six short option, dash p, and then a space three thousand again a short option. Uh, then you see dash dash p s k equals secret. This is the the format they use for a long option. Uh, dash t that meant please use tls, and then you have these additional strings um, uh, www.microsoft.com https. Uh, are not linked to any options. So those are, we'll get to that in a second, those are passed, those are returned from the parsing library to your application. The second line shows a different way of invoking something very similar. Uh, again, it shows uh, the use of a long, uh, the long options, dash dash port equals 3000, which is equivalent to dash P, and dash dash TLS, which is equivalent to dash T. So uh, now I'm gonna show you um, how this works. So what you do is you call the parse method on the options, and you pass the arguments that you received in the command line. And uh, the return is an I enumerable uh, strings. And, and, this is the, uh, uh, and this is everything that was not parsed as an option. 
Uh, and in this case, I just happen to have implemented the convention that the first parameter is the host name and the second parameter is support. Uh, I am choosing in this particular case to uh, default. If the user does not provide a uh, the second parameter. I make the default be HTTP. That's what you see in case one. Uh, and if you don't provide those two arguments, which are kind of mandatory, I show the help. Right? Then we'll get to that in a second. Um, but this is basically the way that you build this uh, command line. Object. So when you run this thing, um, if you wanted to show the help, you invoke this method write option descriptions. You pass a, a uh, output value. Right? In this in this case, I want to send it to the console.error output. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So when you invoke this. Uh, when you invoke uh, the, the command with no arguments, essentially we say, hey, this is an error. So we display to the user a list of possible options uh, that they can use, right? Um, and this is a, you know, it's generated from the data definition that you saw. Now, one thing that has happened, um, one thing that has happened in the last few years, uh, for example, is uh, things like the git command. Let me go here. Um, so the git command, uh, it's now kind of a, a, a collection of commands, right? So if I say git commit, it's actually, or, or git submodule, uh, you see that it's actually a family of commands. And, uh, and there's a couple of interesting elements here. This is the, uh, uh, the subcommand, uh, the, the main command. And then you have these subcommands, add, status, init, init. Uh, there are flags that apply to everything, right? This one that go before. And there are flags and parameters that apply to other ones. So uh, mono.options has full support for these nested commands. Uh, we call them commands, uh, command sets. And uh, when you create a uh, structure, not only you can pass actual definitions of uh, of uh, uh, of, uh, of your commands, but you can also pass strings. And those become part of the standard output, right? So um, so, for example, you say that if I just define the string, this gets uh, to the standard output as usage, right? So you say usage, git version, et cetera. You can see that out there. So this is a nice way of formatting versions and getting an automatic display of, of the things that you have. Um, but what is more interesting here is that you can you can nest them, right? So you can have a new command set submodule, and again, it can get its own help. You can embed the help with your command definition. And then the commands that you want to invoke, so in this case, init, add, remove, uh, with the same patterns that you saw before, right? So, um, and another thing that we also recently added is support this uh, for any commands or subcommands to actually have spaces in their names. So, if it just happens that for for uh, user experience you desire to have a space in the middle, you can certainly do that. Uh, so you could say submodule or subspace module if that's what you want. So now, so that's command line options parsing. It's you know, uh, very interesting. You should go use it today. Now, the second piece is uh, a lot of the tools that I write or tools that I uh, use on a day to day basis have to do are, uh, uh, are interacting with the user in the command line. So, for example, like the shell. So, let me go back to my terminal here. Maybe I should make this a little bit bigger so you can get a, so you can get us, uh, so you can, uh, so you can see this better. Um, for example, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna use this uh, the interactive secret interpreter. Here I can I can uh, you know issue uh, uh, C sharp commands right and get the result. Uh, but what is interesting is that I can I can use the arrow keys here to go back and edit uh, you know the command line and maybe make some changes. Um, but also um, I would like to get code completion on the shell. So if I press dot, I would like to get my uh, I would like to get completion the way that you expected. Something that you can't really get with uh, console.readline. So uh, this is the second library that I want to talk to you about. This is called uh, uh, mono terminal uh, terminal edit. But before we get there, I want to give you a sense of the kind of challenges that we need to cope with when we're building these console applications. Uh, so um, you know when you're interacting uh, with console applications, you don't really know very well what's on the other end. Now, most people and most simulations are based on the uh, on the VT100 uh, 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 set of escape sequences and, and the protocol. So many of the terminal emulators that you use, uh, meta terminal emulators, are essentially supersets of the VT100. And, um, and uh, you know, there's a big evolution of these things. But 
What you have to remember is the VT100 uh, was a terminal that only did black and white. Uh, did black and white, and the idioms you use and the idioms that were used at the time uh, included things like bold fonts, things like reversed uh, settings, which basically swapped white black tag to be uh, black and white, right? So it was kind of limited what you could do, blinking, right? Uh, and you still need to support this because not every term simulator that will connect to your application either on the cloud or on a server or something else like that will support the full spectrum of colors, right? So nowadays you have true color on Windows, you have true color on Mac, so, so things have changed a lot. But you need to keep in mind that when you're building thermal applications, your application needs to work in this different set of environments. So um, the thing that it's, uh, uh, one of the things that is interesting is that the uh, um, is that over the years we've added new capabilities, especially the VT100 core, and uh, they're typically identified uh, as X terminals. And uh, it's a super set of the VT100 set of escape sequences, but they support mouse events. So that means that you can they they can receive clicks, they can receive double clicks, uh, uh, they can track the mouse position. Uh, some of them contain uh, colors. We'll talk about that more in a second. And, uh, and, um, uh, and some of them can even do more interesting things. Can display full Unicode text. You gotta keep that in mind. So now, uh, you know, it's really not a problem of dealing with the console on, on Windows. You have the console API, but on Unix, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, the way that a console application knows what it's building, it doesn't really know what's on the other and the way that attributes and capabilities are determined are based on the term environment variable. So there's an environment variable called term, and based on this, uh, applications tend to look up into a system database called term info, what kind of capabilities are there. So I'm gonna show you what this list of capabilities is. Uh, so, uh, so this is my term, no? It's being an X term dash 256 colors. And if I run the command info comp on Unix, this will dump all the set of the database of capabilities of this term. So this is everything that we know about this term. And uh, some of them are attributes like, for example, the number of colors that the terminal supports, the number of columns that it supports, the number of lines. We'll get back to that in a second. Because you see that my terminal is actually a much larger. It's actually 119 by 29. And here it says 80 by 24. So we'll talk about this in a second. There's this concept of pairs, and we'll return to this later. 2,000 pairs. Um, and uh, some of these are escape sequences that are used for particular things, like clearing the screen or, uh, or moving the cursor to a particular position. And some of the others declare things like what kind of escape sequence is sent when the user presses one of these keys. Like, for example, uh, keys say you piece the arrow key, some of the function keys, right? When you press function key, you get an escape followed by an open place, 18, comma, 2 tilde, right? So this is the database. Now, I can show you uh, that the database for the VT100, by changing the environment variable, it's a lot more limited. You know, it fits on a screen, <laughs> right? Um, so it's a lot more. And uh, so applications actually rely on this information now um, uh, to gather capabilities. Now, there are other, a couple of other uh, items. Uh, in particular, this one, you can see right now that the environment variable lines equal 29 overwrite the overwrite the information that came from the database. So the database says, hey, you have four lines. Well, in reality, you have 29. And not only is this information available on environment, there is also um, also this uh, IO control operation that you can query certain terminals. So sometimes the kernel, the operating system has this information. So typically the way that it works is that the most advanced Applications will try the IO operation. If that fails, they'll fall back to uh, lines and columns. If that fails, it falls back to terminal capabilities. Um, so the IO control operation really doesn't work over serial lines, but it works over uh, pseudo terminals, SSH, uh, emulated environment. Now, uh, like I mentioned before, one of the challenges that you have in this space uh, is not only that you're dealing with old, you know, very old terminals that barely anybody uses, but that a lot of the people that have written terminal emulators uh, have really limited themselves to the 
original set, right? So these are the operations that you have, blink, ball, reverse operation. Then some people uh, added uh, eight colors, right? So you got eight colors for your foreground, eight colors for the background. Uh, some other people added 16 colors. Uh, and that really means that uh, they added another, the, the, the highlighted, you know, the bold version, uh, high intensity colors for the foreground. Uh, other folks like the terminal right now, they support 256 color palette. And uh, and lastly, the thing that um, most everybody, you know, is moving to these days is supporting 24 bit color, right? Uh, now the, the challenge with some of the, we have a couple of challenges here, uh, which is that some of these concepts did not exist when the term info database was shipped. And uh, the libraries that consume these database uh, have not been updated on many of the operating systems that you connect to. So, um, so for example, while the Encurses library, uh, it's a it's is a library, is a go-to library that most people use to talk to your terminal, and it's actively maintained uh, and has all kinds of new capabilities. The problem is that many of the systems that you connect to use an old version of Encurses, and the API has not remained. Uh, the ABI of this library actually is a, is a term at compile time, which means that uh, which means that two systems might have an end curses of the same version. They have different ABIs, right? So there's there's different ways that people have solved this problem. I'm not going to get into that, but one of the challenges that you face when you're building these applications is that the system libraries might not be up to date, right? So some people have taken the approach that they just read the term for database directly, circumventing these dependencies. All right. Now, when you're building these applications, I think that the first thing that uh, that you want to do is, uh, you know, if you have very basic needs, you're not a man of big desires, uh, you can just use a system console API. The good news is that we, we support this on .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Mono. Uh, it does the basics, reading, writing, uh, and it has a limited interactivity capability through the read key API. Uh, you Ask read key to either echo the character or not echo the character. Uh, Lighter being kind of the, uh, the approach that you use for making uh, nice and neat interactive applications. Uh, it is limited in that it only supports cursors. Um, it does some cursor positioning, uh, but beyond that, it has a lot of limitations, and we'll talk about those later. But uh, uh, but in particular, it's it's an API that doesn't doesn't even serve all the capabilities of the Windows console. So it's really a uh, it's really a subset of, of the thing uh, that you want to do in a modern console app. Uh, and like I said, also the other problem is that it's really a bad match for Unix. It doesn't really work well with Unix. Um, you know, in Windows, there's this concept that you can draw to any other position on the screen, and uh, the display gets uh, refreshed at one point. In in Unix, actually, if you want to update a piece of the screen, you must uh, first in the escape sequence that moves the cursor to that position and then you write your, your text. Um, so this is a little bit challenging because it's not very efficient. You want to constantly change the cursor position uh, to write character. You want to accumulate all the data and then have a wash operation that optimizes uh, just how much text you sent, right? And, and really the big problem is that there's really no reasoning at higher levels about this, right? You really uh, you really have to roll your own. So we'll talk about some of the things that uh, you can do today. Uh, so interactive line editing, this is the demo that I just showed a second ago, is how do you write applications that, that are a little bit better in read line, right? If you, if you write an app, let me show you. If you write an app today, uh, 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 just calls a, uh, You don't really get a good experience, right? So I, I'm, I'm writing hello world here, hello world, and I try to use the arrow keys. It doesn't really move, right? And uh, I can't really do much. I cannot really edit this thing. I'm pressing the arrow keys, but nothing is happening. So this is uh, this is the kind of experience that you get with read line. It's not great. Um, so what you can do in this uh, in this particular case is you want to use a library that can replace this. In this we have the mono dot line edit library. Uh, gives you the uh, editing of your Input with the cursor keys. Uh, it also has Emacs key binding, and uh, you know that's because uh, we're Unix. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote it. I'm a Unix person. It also uses most of the Windows binding. Uh, 
So, you know, the home cursor and, you know, home key, end key, left, right, uh, you know, control left, control right, all that stuff works. But most importantly, in Unix, where some of these mappings are not available on every terminal, um, we use the Emacs key bindings, right? And the other capability is that it also has a feature that can save the history of all of your commands. So it really, it's, it, it's very close to the, to the libraries that have been used in Unix for many years. Uh, so we save the history, uh, the library saves the history and can restore the history next time that you start it. So you provide an identifier for where you want the history to come from. And also it has a, uh, it has search in the history, right? And like I showed before, it has optional completion. So uh, this is how you use it. Uh, you create an instance of the line editor class, right? You provide ID for the history, right? And how big on the history to be, right? In the they said, I want to keep 300, uh, 300 items in the history, and, uh, and the history label is going to be my app history, right? And then you just call the editor.edit, the return value is a string, right? And uses the prompt that you Now, let me, uh, let me show you right, the history in action, right? So if I invoke the c -sharp library, the c -sharp command again, and just press the up arrow, you can see that I can go through my history of things that I've done. In fact, I don't even know what I'm doing here. Look at this. I guess a few days ago I was testing some uh, bug iOS, but uh, you can just go through the history here. Now the other thing that is interesting is that it has search. So if I press the Control R key, when you press Control R, it enables reverse uh, incremental search. So as I type right A S right, it goes through history and finds uh, the match for uh, for I was looking for in this case assembly, or I could try for example. Uh, C console. If I press control R again, I try to find the previous in history. So I keep pressing control R and it will keep going through all the matches in history. Right. So uh, so that's a history uh, search uh, that I just showed you. Well, I should have waited for this thing, but you know, I, I have a nice uh, uh, cheat sheet that you can use later to remember this. Um, now the completion I showed you, uh, I showed you a couple of minutes ago that when you press the dot on uh, the C sharp command, you actually get a list of, uh, of valid options that you can use. Um, I'm going to show you how you wire up. The way that you wire this up is that you uh, set up this uh, uh, this delegate. You hook it up to the auto complete event, and this delegate gets um, gets a, a string with the full input at this point that the user has entered. So it's really whatever you want to show. And the position where the cursor is inside, right? Um, in this case, implementation is super simple. I just happened to call the, uh, the C Sharp uh, uh, compiler and I said, please give me the completions for, for this at this particular point, right? So uh, in this case, I extract the, uh, the, the complete string there. I just, I cut the input string. I only interested in everything up to the point where the cursor is. And then I, I'll tell the compiler, please give me a list of completions. And your job uh, uh, inside the delegate is to return, right, an object of, uh, you know, instance of the completion object uh, that provides both the prefix, right, and, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that essentially gives you all the elements that were identical in the list and an array of the completions. And that's all you have to do. Uh, then you can implement completion. The one thing that you have to keep in mind here is that you see the little line here at the top, the second heuristics modes equals C sharp. Uh, the default, the default behavior of the line editor is to provide completion when you press the tab. This is very similar to what uh, what you would get on Unix shell, right? You want to get completion, you press the tab key, and then it kicks the other complete event. The heuristics mode, all it does, is enable C sharp is that it also triggers automatically the completion when you have a dot. So if you press a dot, it automatically triggers it. And in this particular case, it's smart but string, so it doesn't it doesn't trigger it inside a string. So you can remove the heuristics mode and you would get the default uh, this. Now, let's move on to the most exciting piece uh, for me, which is uh, text user interfaces. <clears throat> so this is a library that I, that I uh, it's a label Love, uh, you know, the other two libraries uh, have existed in Unix for many years or in the .NET world for maybe 10 years or more. Uh, this is a library that I, I I built some uh, maybe six years ago. I can't remember, six, seven years ago, or eight years ago, and uh, kind of abandoned it at the time. 
um, because Silverlight was happening and Silverlight was the hot thing at the time. And, and now, now that the, the cloud is big and uh, SSH is back in vogue, I decided to that thing. Uh, that's why the project was called GUI.cs. UI toolkit used to be implemented in a single file. Uh, these days, I split it up on many one, right? So the project is called Terminal with GUI, and uh, and it's a, it's essentially a toolkit for building uh, these kind of applications, right? So what you see here is a uh, is one of these apps, uh, and it shows just a, a collection of uh, UI elements, right? Uh, labels like login and password, entry lines uh, for entering your login or your password, check boxes, uh, radio buttons. You can see them. You can choose between personal and company um, buttons like and cancel a menu bar at the top, uh, right? So this is the kind of thing that I wanted to build and I, and, and I wanted to create a lot of these applications, right? And you don't want to build this yourself. You don't want to paint every element. You want to uh, recreate all of these things, handle hotkeys, mouse, events, and so on. So it's really, you have to think about terminal as a as a uh, UI framework, similar in spirit to what you use when you're building desktop apps or, or mobile but for uh, console apps, right? So uh, the, the code that you see on the left is, is implemented roughly with the code that you see on the right. Uh, so let me walk you through a couple of interesting elements here. The first one is, uh, you know, you, you bring the uh, terminal. Uh, the second one is that before you get started, you need to call application.init. And that, that determines uh, which drive to use. We'll talk about that later. It determines how many colors are available, which styles are available, which uh, uh, you know, attributes you can use. Uh, if here's the application for running. Then um, here, I just the next line is our topical application top. It's just a convenience. I want to be able to convenient to the top level uh, view of the application. I will talk about views in a second. Then I create a uh, I create a window. I create it this uh, type of rectangle. We'll talk more about that in a second, but essentially I create a window uh, that doesn't cover the first line. So I say, give me, give me a frame that covers everything but the top. And I give it a little name. Uh, then I add the result, right? So the kind of window, I add that uh, window to the top. Then I create the menu bar and I add the menu bar to the top again. A uh, couple of items here to uh, look for. The underscore in, in front of the letter uh, highlights uh, the letter in the UI and also makes it a hotkey. So if the user presses that letter, uh, he activates that entry. And then uh, you can see how I created a bunch of the elements in the UI just by creating instances of these views and adding them all to the window. And finally, I call application.run, which triggers the main loop. So, uh, so, um, some of the things that GUI does, we've covered some of the elements in this slide, but some of the things that are worth keeping in mind is that the library takes some of the limitations that exist in, in terminal apps today. For example, um, some old terminals or emulator lack the mapping of the alt, uh, alt key, right? Uh, it, uh, it deals also with the challenge of some terminals have colors and some of them don't have colors. So at the startup, we Set up a set. Uh, I set up a, a set of styles that you can use and you can reliably use on your app so that it looks correct and works properly. Uh, on systems that support it, we automatically handle. I or well, the library automatically handles resize of the terminal. Uh, it takes care of input events uh, and running your main. Uh, as you use the API, you'll see that I've actually taken many ideas from uh, the iOS UI Kit design. So if you use UI Kit, you'll be familiar with a lot of the concepts. And, uh, and you see that I borrow extensively GTA and Windows games as well. Now, application.run is, uh, is, is the thing that makes your application tick, right? It's, uh, it provides a main loop. Um, what this means is the application.run is in charge of fetching input events, and that can be a, a keyboard input or a mouse input. It also handles timers. So if you want to have an application that or methods that get triggered every you know, 10 seconds or every minute or every something, you can uh, you can register though there. You can also have a method be invoked uh, when the application is idle when there's nothing else to do. So you can have a method that you can uh, invoke uh, when there's nothing uh, pending to do. On Unix systems, we can also monitor uh, 
file descriptors. Uh, this is not possible on Windows today, but uh, we can monitor whether a socket is ready for reading or writing or a file is ready for reading or writing, uh, which is, makes it very convenient for building event-based applications, right? So if you want to say, hey, notify me when the socket is ready and, and you, you forget about this and you don't want to create a thread, you can do it here, right? Um, we all, I, the library also handles uh, a semantic for Unix suspending. So in Unix, when you press Control Z, your application is supposed to reset the terminal to a same state, uh, get, get you back to shell. And then when you press FG, it's supposed to bring you back to the application, right? So let me see if I, uh, so uh, like this, right? I have an application, if I press Control Z, it suspends the app, right? The app is suspended, and if I press FG, foreground, it brings it back to life, right? So, uh, so the framework takes care of this. The other thing that application run does is that it's in charge of managing the focus, drawing the focus, controlling the focus, and sending events to the proper views on the screen, as well as redrawing affected areas of the screen. Now, a common idiom in Unix is, uh, is, uh, uh, is to press the control L key. So sometimes if you're dealing with a terminal, uh, either because noise on the line or background process is writing stuff to your screen. Like for example, uh, I could write something like, uh, while true do echo oh, slip key. Right, so this thing is just gonna keep spamming my terminal every three seconds, right? Actually, let me make it faster. Um, get better, right? So every every second, right? So sometimes you have an application like this one, and there's a background process that is spamming your console, right? And so a common idiom on Unix is that you press the Control L key, and Control L should always refresh the display, right? So uh, so this takes care of uh, uh, so the application framework already takes care of this for you. The control L is already hardwired for you as well. So, uh, keyboard input on Windows, everything in your works expected. There's really not much uh, to do there. But on Unix, like I said, we're dealing with a wide spectrum of uh, systems. Uh, and some of the challenges that you have with the keyboard input is sometimes there are no function keys, right? There are no function keys, but you want to, your user to use function keys. Um, and it's not obvious how to map them. And uh, some terminals do not have a, a, a notion of, uh, of Alt keys or escape keys, or they are misconfigured, right? Or sometimes people don't know how to configure these things. So GUI.CS does two things for you. First, it maps the sequence escape plus a number, right? So pressing the escape key plus a number is mapped to function key, a number, right? So if you don't have an F1 keyboard or you don't know how to get it, or you're on an iPhone key, uh, or SSH something, and you don't know how to send the F function key, you can press escape and a number. Actually, it's a good point. If you're using an S client on the iPhone, uh, some of the clients do not have, or Android do not have uh, F keys. Uh, the other one is alt combinations, right? If you want to say alt X or you know alt S or anything else, uh, pressing escape plus a letter is mapped also to the uh, letter. And this, for those of you that use Emacs, you'll know that this is exactly what Emacs does. Uh, and this is interesting because in dialog boxes, you want to, you know, in the DOS era, uh, you use alt plus the letter to, uh, to automatically focus or activate that particular control, right? So everything that has a hot uh, spot, right? Hot spot or things like, uh, you know, uh, 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 the hot spots are any, anything that has a different colors. For example, P totals, the hot spot is L. So if I press L, the focus goes there. Or if I press E, it takes me over there, right? So those are the hot spots. Um, now, the system is built on this concept of views, right? Um, and this is the very same concept that you have on UI view. Um, and these views have a frame, and the frame uh, defines the whole region that the view will cover on the screen. And, and, and you can assign it in two ways. Uh, you can set the absolute frame, so when you create your object, you pass a rect object, right? And, and this sets an absolute position. Right? If you create a rect, if you pass a rect parameter, it will set an absolute position. Or you can set the x, y, width, and height property menu. These are not integers. These are magical. So we'll talk about the magic between, behind x, y, width, and height in a second. Right? Um, another thing to, to, to know is that the x direction moves uh, left to right and the y top to bottom. Right? Now, uh, one notion that came directly from iOS is that views can have nested views and those in turn can have views. 
So it's a composable model. Uh, when you build a, com a compound user interface, you just can compose this by adding views inside each other. And the focus system works by navigating the tree. So it's the visual, it's the visual appearance that the user will see. So what we do is we walk the tree hierarchy. Well, not the user it sees, but we walk the tree hierarchy and try to give the focus to the next view in the hierarchy. And if there is no view, uh, no more contained, for example, in this case, uh, this, uh, these two orange ones inside the green one, inside the white, the yellow one inside the orange one. If one of those, if the last one was focused and it pressed the tab button to move to the next focused item, it would try to focus maybe the, the, the green element at the top. If that element is not focusable, right? Oh, no, no, it will go to the next logical one. In this case, since it's the last one, it will go to the green on top, right? So it tries to follow the, well, it follows the order in which you created the views inside each one of these. Now, not all the views are focusable. This is something you can control. Um, so, the, so we'll get that in a second. Now, some things to keep in mind. These are some of the core types of the framework. Uh, there's three structures. One defines a rectangle, another defines a point, and another defines a size. And you'll use this um, uh, in a bunch of places. So for example, the frame object is of type rect, and it represents the absolute position that the object currently has, right? that the view currently has. So let's talk about layout. Uh, like I said, you can pass a rect object and that will be an absolute uh, view of your, uh, you know, the absolute position that you want to give your view. Uh, and the problem with this is that once you do that, you're on your own. If the user changes the terminal size, if, uh, you know, the view changes its size for other reasons, you have to manually change the frame of every view, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a caveman, right? So, and you have to do it by overriding the layout subview method the view that made the poor decision of making them absolute. The other thing that you can do, and this is something that I struggled. I figure, do I want to have a layout system that, use, that measures the objects? Or, you know, and each object does the whole protocol. What is your desired size? How big can you be, right? What is your desired size and your minimum size and your maximum size? And then implement stack views and uh, stacks and boxes and tables. And I felt that that was too complicated for this. I felt I wanted to do something simpler. And I came up with this idea. So the X and Y properties are a type called POS, P-O-S, uh, that stands for position. And the width and height are of a type called uh, And And uh, the other nice thing is that any integer values are implicitly convertible. So if you, if you really want to just set the X position to zero, you just set X equals zero, and that will anchor the value of x to zero, right? There's no, there's no, there's no interesting stuff going. On. But you can do a lot of really clever stuff if you use the pause and the imposition. So let's look at, let's let, let's take a look at pause. There's a number of um, there's a number of uh, static methods in pause that you can call. So if you call, for example, pause dot percent and then number, right? It will give a percentage. Uh, uh, it will it will return a percentage within the container. Right, so you can use this to position elements at a percentage inside your container view, or you can say anchor end, which will essentially give you a position that is computing from the right side of the view. Right, so if you say anchor end zero, it will give you the right value, right versus zero, which is always the left. Right, so you don't really need anchor start uh, because it's, it's it's essentially just setting the x to an absolute position. Right, you can use center to get the center within the container of this view. And the interesting thing here is that the operator plus and minus are overcoded. So it lets you do things like, for example, center minus 10, right? Or left minus four, right? And, uh, and so on. Now, the four next that come, left, top, right, and bottom. These let you poke at the left side, the left side of the specified view. It can be the container view, it can be one of your peer views, right? And uh, we do a topological sort here, I do a library. Uh, we do a topological sort to identify to compute uh, to compute this thing, and if you have cycles, of course you're going to get an error. But um, but essentially, um, uh, you can say I want to get I want to uh, the, the position that I'm going to set is going to be relative to the left, the top, the right, or the bottom of this other view. So that's why I have to compute this thing, right? Uh, and I mentioned it's very similar. Right? Uh, you have like fill, right? That will perform a fill based on uh, the top view, right? Um, and uh, or 
can set uh, and, and you can also uh, do the same operation. So let me give you a taste of what it looks like. Right? So for example, in this scenario, I'm saying I want the login. I want the X position to be centered. I want the my 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 column to be centered in my container. The Y position to be six. Now the password, um, you know, it's a table that really should come, uh, you know, be low, right? It should be aligned with the first one. So what I'm saying is, you know, give me the left side of the previous right? But I want the Y to be just one uh, below. So you say, give me the bottom of the login and then add one space, right? Uh, and you can see how this works, you know. Uh, and, uh, on login text, uh, I actually can say, well, give me the right, uh, rightmost position of the password and give me the topmost position of the login. That's how I configured it. And I set up, I hard code the width. Uh, and you can see how this is used, right? You can see on past tag, right, the, the, the element. My X position is, is, is relative to the login text. My top position is relative to the password, right? That's how I align it, right? Uh, <clears throat> and so, and the last example just shows, you know, just fill the whole screen, give me one space back. Right? Um, so this is the kind of, this is the layout that the, the layout we have. And it's it's simpler to understand or simple to consider than uh, other systems like, uh, that iOS informs have where you can enter a particular point and you have to pass all these flags. In my mind, this is a lot simpler model to think about. And I'm quite proud of this thing, quite proud of this thing. Um, now let's talk about another, uh, so I already there's a special kind of view called the top level, and uh, they're only special because they participate in, in uh, model event handling. So this is important when you pop up a dialog and you want to use it to, uh, and, and you want to capture all events. You don't want events to go to other elements in the UI. So uh, when you pop up a model view, you don't want the mouse to click outside of, of, of this particular top level and the event going to the one behind the events, right? Um, so you need to pass a top level view to application level if you want to run one of these, right? Uh, there's two kinds of top level, really. Uh, uh, the top level, which is just an empty top level, or the window, which is just a top level with a, a nice decoration title, and uh, and dialogues, which are subclasses like that, right? Now the views, like I said, uh, every view by default uh, determines whether uh, it can be uh, has a focus or whether it can be focused. Some of them hard code, right? Labels, for example, uh, write this method and say, doesn't matter for the set method, I can never focus on it, right? Um, some of them you can control whether you want to focus or not, right? For example, if you disable an entry, you don't want it to be focused, just set cancel, right? And then at the core of all these views, there's these four methods. Uh, every time that there's a, a kiss, the system first goes through all the views in the top order, right? And it says, hey, do you want to process this as a hot key? This is when you say escape letter. First, you give a chance for everybody to respond to the hot key. If nobody responds to the hot key, then you process it as a regular key, right? And if nobody responded or wanted the key, then you say, hey, I have a cold key about to, to throw it away. Are you interested in this? And finally, the last event is a mouse event. You can modify when anything happens with the mouse. And, and the mouse event structure contains information clicking or moving or stuff like that. Now, let's talk about color because this is a challenging topic. Uh, you don't really use colors in without direct. Although some classes surface convenience, you really want to think in terms of attributes. And an attribute uh, and an attribute uh, abstracts over both the foreground color for the cell and the background color of the cell. Uh, or you know the black and white description. And this is why it's important because uh, when you build your application, you want your app to work both in color uh, for terminals that support it and terminals that don't support it, right? Um, at Startup, I create a bunch of these for you. So out of the box, there's already a, a set of styles. I've only defined one styles. I would love if somebody else contributes more styles, but uh, but it's important that you build your app like this because you want your app, right? The, the one on the left, as you can see, you can still use it if you're, you know, I, I forced in the left side, uh, the terminal to be VT100, and you can still use it if you have a, a you know a, a, a limited emulator like the one built to Emacs, for example. Um, on the one on the right, you have a more capable terminal, so you can use all the colors. So, as far as the views are concerned, we're actually just dealing with attributes, and we're dealing with them um, in, a, in a couple of ways. Um, but before we talk about this, uh, about about how they deal with them, 
I want to look at one particular uh, set of views here because you'll notice that you actually need a bunch of different colors for this UI to work. Um, so uh, for example, remember me, right? Uh, right now it's not focused and there's both a hotkey, the R, and then there's a regular text. So you really need two separate attributes. You need one attribute for the hotkey, one attribute for the regular text. And you can see that the second lane is focused. Right? You want to give the user an indication that this is where the focus is. Uh, the focus is shown in two ways. The cursor is shown in the right position of the view, but also the label is painted differently. And you see here again, the attribute for the hotkey is different than the attribute for the text. So we're really talking about four colors. So this is what I call the normal color. This is called the normal color. Uh, this one is called the hot normal color, right? That hotkey applied to, uh, to the normal text. This is the focus color, and this is the hot focus color, right? Those are the four colors that you use. And I call these things uh, color schemes. Um, and by default, the, the set styles that you have, you want to use, uh, I, today I have four different styles. You can see three of them on the screen right now. Uh, the base scheme of colors, so all the views use a scheme, and uh, and they inherit their scheme from their top level container. So when you uh, when you look at everything that is blue, uh, and you see the it's a screenshot that I showed you a few times already, uh, where you have the login and password and so on. That one is using the base style. Now uh, the pop up that you see there that says quit demo. Are you sure you want to quit this demo? That one is using the dialogue style, right? And you see essentially all the views behave the same. Because posted inside this uh, in a dialogue, uh, the text is different, right? Uh, and the idea is that it, it's highlighted, and even if you run it on a uh, on a uh, on a VT100, you'll get this inverse uh, style. And then we have a different style for the menu. You don't see here the arrow one, but usually it's uh, on black and white is like uh, stride and bold, and and uh, and on color it's red, right? So you want to use the styles for your application. Now there's a bunch of views, you know, it's not as comprehensive as, uh, as iOS or WPF in terms of views that are uh, built into this, but you know, if you want to contribute, I'll, I'll take your patches. Um, there's the kind of thing that you expect from here, uh, from, from a UI tool, that, uh, you know, buttons, entries, checkboxes, progress, radio buttons. Uh, text field is a one line editor, is the one that you can see. Uh, and text view is a full screen editor. Let me show you that. Actually, I don't even know if I have it on this machine. Uh, that would be a problem. Uh, where's oh well, uh, it's not there. If I can build, it. if it doesn't, I might not have this here. Oh, ooh, look at that. Well, all right, never mind. I didn't test it on this machine. I uh, have it on the other. One. But anyways, it's a full screen text view editor. If I have time at the end, I'll build it with uh, Visual Studio and I'll show you this. But it's a it's a full screen uh, editor. Um, and scroll views are interesting because this is a concept from iOS. A scroll view essentially lets you, uh, uh, you can add views there and you can control where is the scroll position. And when the view is coming to display, they'll be shown, otherwise it will be hidden, right? So, uh, so you, can, you can completely embed it, the entire application inside of the view and still be able to use uh, menus. Uh, frame view, of course, because, uh, you know, uh, because I'm a software engineer, there's an X view that that gives you an accessible dump that you can use. Um, then, uh, like I said, uh, those are the views. Now let's talk about the dialogues. I have a handful of dialogues that are kind of useful. Uh, the dialogue is just a window and you can pass a couple of buttons. So the dialogue is just a window with buttons and then you can run this uh, and, and it will be mobile. And when it completes running, either because you press escape or you manually request it to stop the execution, it will return control. So this application run does not return control until the user is uh, is with this. Um, the message box is a variation of dialog. All it does, very common scenarios. I don't want to set up buttons. I don't want to check the set of handlers. Just ask the user yes or no question. I right? will return the value, uh, which is the index of the option that was selected, or minus one if the user uh, canceled. Right, and there's a variation for showing errors as well. All it does changes the style. There's a file open dialog, right? If you want to open uh, files or you want to save files, you can use open dialog, file dialog, uh, uh, save dialog. Uh, the capabilities of these ones, I borrowed those from OS. So it is the kind of APIs that you find in NS open panel and NS save panel. Um, so it's basically the same stuff, and, and I kind of uh, you know, copied the 
the capabilities from there. Um, have file paths there, whether you can choose file directories or allows multiple selection at once. So borrow heavily from there. Uh, <clears throat> oh, one thing that you want to see here uh, when you look at the cancel and open buttons, uh, the open um, has this, uh, the open button has this additional uh, less than or bigger than signs, and that means that is the default action. So if you press a return key, uh, in uh, even if you're not focused, if you're not focused on the open button, it will trigger the open action. Right? So if you press return at any point, it will just trigger the open option. And that gives you the, the capability of essentially picking something with the cursor, pressing return, and it does what you expect. Now, hey, um, Miguel. It's threat aware, but it's not threat safe. So one thing that happens, some of my users uh, go and use uh, GUI.cs and they go and start threads and then they start poking at the poking at the GUI.cs and they say, hey, it doesn't not working, right? Sometimes it crashes if you're lucky, but most often it doesn't work the way that they expect. And the reason is that like, like almost every UI toolkit in the world, uh, GUI.cs is not threat aware. It's too difficult to make a GUI toolkit threat, uh, threat safe, but it's threat aware. Um, what that means is, uh, first of all, I do provide a sync context. And what that means is that you can just use a sync and a way to your heart content and the right thing will happen. So just use a sync and a way the way that you would do it with a WinForms or WPF app and the right thing will happen. Um, now, some of you don't use a uh, task or a sync or a wait, or you already have a background thread. So if you really have a background thread, then use, use this method, application main loop dot invoke. Uh, and you pass an action. And what that will do is essentially is it will queue the action to be executed on the main thread. So when the framework is in a good place to listen to you, right? And typically, and all this does behind the scenes is really add an idle handler for you, a one-shot idle handler that runs your action. And that's how it Okay. Now, uh, there's a hey, couple Miguel. of drivers today. Can you hear us okay? But, uh, I have a subscriber that uses Anchors' as library, uh, the system console driver that uses uh, what .NET provides out of the box. But like I said, it's very limiting. So uh, this is how I started to test on Windows, but it, it has just too many problems. So I implemented a native Windows driver that, uh, that has all the capabilities that you need and the proper mouse processing and all of that stuff. Um, in the future, in my copious per time, I will implement, uh, I'm going to get rid of Anchors because in curses is, uh, for example, on Mac OS is shipped uh, with fewer capabilities than it needs, so it limits the, the, the spectrum of colors that you can use. So I'm gonna be building a new driver for this. Now, if you don't like my API and my view design and all of this stuff, I have good news for you. Uh, the amazing uh, Javier Suarez uh, has built a Xamarin Forms backend. So uh, this was supposed to be animated. Uh, that is very sad, I don't know how to animate this. Hey, Miguel. Uh, well, Miguel. I'll publish the PowerPoint so you can see them. But if you go to this website, you can see the animations of these things. And this is effects. Oh, is this animating? No. Hey, Miguel, we're um, running a little bit long. But uh, you, uh, this is essentially, uh, this is the live preview of your XAML, right? The thing on the right side is actually a live uh, previewer. So when you press the preview button, it actually shows a preview on the right side of your UI. So this is just Xamarin Forms. The Xamarin Forms that you love on mobile, on Mac, on Windows, uh, Javier uh, wrote a Xamarin Forms backend for the console, and uh, and if you want, if that's your cup of tea, then you can use Xamarin Forms and build a UI for the console. Now let's get to creating commands. So you've done all the work, you've done your amazing command line uh, parsing, you've done your line editing for your, some kind of apps, or you built an amazing GUI app. Now you want to actually uh, uh, use this on your system without having to type .NET run or you know going to the directory. And hey Miguel, can you can you hear us? Or, type a long command line. So um, what you need to do is you take your console app, right? You take your console app that you Maybe just built. Muted and you need to do the us. following things. You need to give it a package ID. Probably. Not all of these are necessary, but just, just follow my lead. this is good this, I know, it's good. You set a package ID. You flag it as is tool true, pack as tool true. And then you give it a name, right? My package name is the name that you can use to publish this to Nuge, um, to the Nuge repository. Uh, but the command that you want to type as a user, you typically want it to be lowercase, right? And, uh, so in this particular case, give it the name that you want to use. In this case, it's my tool. And once you've made these changes to your CS proj file, you just say .NET pack, and that will generate your package, right? That, that will go compile and generate the, the package. And, and then you install it with this command, .NET tool install, and then you pass dash dash global, right? 
And then uh, in this case, I didn't want to add a source. So you just say add source, the bin debug directory and the package name, and that installs the package into the system. And then you can just use the my tool command at your, at your heart's content. Uh, if you don't want this to be global, um, uh, you can pass the, the tool path and the directory that you want it to be installed, for example, your log or slash bin or whatever. This is very so this is the way that you take your your your, your, your amazing app and make it a system tool. Uh, this is similar to what people do with npm, right? So now you have no excuse to not use .NET. If your excuse was well, npm has dash g. Well, now you have this thing here, so you can actually write the uh, app in a distant language. Um, finally, <clears throat> in the mono world, we also have this concept of single contained by executable. So Instead of having to, to have the .NET runtime installed, because this, this, this requires you to install the .NET runtime. Uh, uh, so we made it so that you could take application and, uh, and generate a single executable. No dependencies, everything is embedded into a big, fat executable, every one of your dependencies. And in particular, in this case, if this is a bold one. This is actually using Mac API. Uh, so, so in this case, I'm linking with all, absolutely all the Mac API. And uh, and shipping the result, right? This is my nc sharp command. So all you have to do is call mk bundle dash dash simple and your executable dash o the name that you give to your command. Now the two secondary libraries are have to do with the fact that this is a uh, a library that is using native API. So it's actually this is a complicated command line. So uh, so this is using the Xamarin Mac APIs, and uh, you can see that it embeds and produces this fat big fat uh, executable, which is uh, almost 10 megabytes big. You can see it at the end. Uh, but what is nice is that this is a self-contained executable. You can copy this file and give it to your friends, family, spouses, or kids, and they don't need to install Mono. They don't need to install .NET. This is a self-contained executable. Now, we're taking this to the next step, and we said, well, what if you have a Mac, but uh, you know, uh, your daughter has a Raspberry Pi? Well, if you're not, I have a solution. Uh, MK Bundle can also Right, so uh, uh, you can cross. We support a ton of libraries. In fact, you see that uh, you know if you look at the right side on the screenshot, there's a little dot. That's because I had to cut the output. Uh, there's not enough screen space to list all the target platforms. So I just pasted the last last piece, which is model dot five fourteen, and all the the the, uh, the target platforms you can target from. Uh, again, I couldn't fit everything on the screen, so you know, get what you get, and. So what you have to do is, is, first of all, the system currently has two targets, the default, right? So build, which is what you saw in the previous screen, or uh, demo was something I was testing, or all the targets that are available for download from our server. So what you do is, uh, here I'm gonna show you, the first line says, hey, tell me what operating system I'm on. Okay, you're on Darwin. It's an iMac and it's running, uh, it's an x86 core machine, that's fine. So the second line I say, hey, go get me the target fetch target, and I tell it the name of the target that I got from the previous screen. So in this case, I want, mono, I want a mono runtime for Ubuntu uh, 18.04 for ARM64. And then again, I say, hey, give me the list of targets, and it shows that I have it now installed. And then I just say, hey, uh, create me a, a cross compiler for my command, right? So build me a native executable for that platform. Right, so that's what the the the, the fourth command does, and finally, uh, you know, it generates this a dot out executable. That's what it's saying. That's the default output name in Unix, and then I say, hey, tell me what this a dot out executable is. Right, so remember, the first line is telling me you're on a Mac, an x86 64 platform. The last line is saying, hey, this is a native executable for an ARM 64. Right, uh, using the ELF file format, 64 bit architecture. Hey, everybody, so as Linux. you know, we can't right. get Miguel so, to respond. Um, so I think it. we're muted on his can, end. Uh, so, what we're going to do, we're going to uh, roll into our commercial break and get uh, things situated over here. So, thank you so much, yeah. and we'll get this content posted. Uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Build it and ship it off to your friends. And.